Welcome to episode 45 of the Rescued by Dragons fantasy fiction podcast, Tales of the Brunch Club. My name is Brian Mesmer, and I'm not only your storyteller, but the dungeon master behind the homebrew Dungeons & Dragons campaign this adventure is based on. Please join me as I tell the tale of how my players and the dice ruined and improved my perfectly laid plans. But first, a quick recap. In episode 44, the Brunch Club returned to Elnor and bade farewell to Calivar. During dinner with Solania, they learned that the unfriendly librarian, Shitman, was obsessed with all things elvish. Drusilla shared her prophecy with him in exchange for the location of a touchpoint, where they would be able to send Rajat to the Feywild. Shipman was thrilled with the prophecy. He told them it was most likely the long-lost first half of the Moonfall prophecy that foretold the emergence of an ominous presence called the Hungerer. The librarian shared some information related to Laura's past and with the Obsidian Watch, and told them the closest Fey touchpoint was near the gates of Tor in the Aegis Mountains. And now, Chapter 45, The Weird Stuff Costs More. The Brunch Club left the Crystal Spire Library feeling more hopeful than they had in quite some time. They didn't have what would be called a fully formed plan, but they had a destination, which was more than they had before. This newfound purpose, or a newfound direction at least, rode with them as they descended steep cliffs and magic elevators to Elnor's dock district. They found the harbor master's office and asked if there were any ships sailing to Sturgeon leaving soon. The harbor master informed them that the light merchant vessel Scallywag was leaving for Sturgeon at first light tomorrow morning. He told them where on the docks the vessel was berthed. With the salty beard, tan skin, crinkled eyes, and bandana around his neck, Captain Hubert was the living archetype of a sea captain. He even had a wooden peg replacing the lower half of one of his legs. Diesa remarked about how tall he was as they approached. He turned toward them, smiled, and said, Aye, and I'd be even taller, but as you can see, I lost a foot. Yes, he could take them to Sturgeon. It would cost them five gold each, four for Jory, since he was so small. The scallywag would set sail two hours after sunrise tomorrow, with or without them. They promised to be there. The brunch club wondered how to spend the night waiting for the ship. Captain Hubert mentioned he would be spending the night at a local dive bar called the Krusty Clam. How are the drinks? said Drusilla. Bad, but cheap, Hubert answered. How's their whoring? Deesa asked. Bad, but cheap, the captain repeated. Sounds perfect, smiled Alora. Tonight's a good night to go, too, Hubert told them. It's trivia night. There were a few hours left in the day, so the five adventurers decided to head back up the cliffs and into the main city. They visited the I-don't-care-at-all jewelry smith with the intention of trading some of their looted gems for gold to raise money to buy a bag of holding. This also gave Salas a chance to reunite with Tuft. They entered the store and saw Tuft busily working on a piece of jewelry. He looked up when he heard them enter. He was wearing a pair of jeweler's glasses which made his eyes look comically large. Salas laughed. Tuft grinned sheepishly, took the glasses off, and greeted them. What what can I do for you today, Brunch Club? he asked. Um, we've got some gems we'd like to sell if you're buying, Salas said. Tuft mentioned they're always in the market for quality gems. He took the bag from them and told them he'd be right back. He needed to go into the back room where the scales were. Can I watch? Salas asked, following him closely. Yeah, sure, Tuft said, beaming. Can I watch too? Dias asked. The others snickered. Um, no, said Tuft, and closed the door behind them. As Salas and Tuft went into the back room, the brunch club quickly gathered close to the counter. They leaned toward the door as far as they could so they could hear what the two gnomes were talking about. So, how do you like living upstairs with your grandmother? Salas asked. Oh, it's great, Tuft said with earnest sincerity. I think family is very important, don't you? In the front room, the others looked at each other, nervously, knowing Salas's fatal relationship with her own father. Not to me, Salas replied quickly, without seeming upset. The conversation seemed to stall a little. Um, so... Salas started searching for something else to say. Do you want to spend the night with me? Tuff blurted out. They heard laughter from the front of the store. Tuff's face reddened. He quickly added, I mean, like, go out, go, go do something, hang out. 
Before Silas could reply, they heard Alora call out, Invite him to the Krusty Clam! Yeah, so we're going to this cool-sounding dive bar at the docks tonight. You want to come with us? Silas asked him. It's trivia night, she added, trying to sweeten the deal. Tuft did like trivia, and was happy to be invited to spend time with the beguiling sorceress. He was a little disappointed that it wouldn't be alone. Nevertheless, he happily agreed. They heard the others cheer from the other room. Silas sighed and rolled her eyes. They left the jewelry store with fifteen less gems, but six hundred more gold pieces. Tuft had given them the name of an enchanted goods emporium where they might be able to find a bag of holding. He also told them where they could have a sending spell cast. At the Wizard Ward Wares, they purchased their bag of holding. Drusilla asked about another bag that caught her eye. It was an unassuming, furry, gray bag. The enchanter explained it was a gray bag of tricks. Once a day, the owner could withdraw up to three random, small, furry creatures to do your bidding. The creatures vanished at dawn the next day. The animals withdrawn could be a weasel, giant rat, badger, boar, a panther, giant badger, direwolf, or a giant elk. Drusilla was already counting the gold out before the enchanter finished the description of the item. The next stop was a small nook of a shop called Correspondence. They wrote down the 25-word message for the wizard to magically send to Rajat. He was to meet them in Sturgeon seven days from tomorrow. Rajat replied that he would be there and hoped it was worth his time. The crusty clam was filled to capacity. All the tables were occupied with drinks and their drinkers. They saw Tuff standing against the wall, keeping an eye on the door. A dwarf walked past him and ruffled his bright red hair. Boy, am I glad to see you, Tuff sighed when they approached. I can't tell you how many times I've had my hair ruffled in the last half hour. Looks like we'll have to stand, muttered Drusilla as she scanned the packed tavern. We could fight someone for their table, Deasa suggested. Only half-joking. Jory walked to a table with drunken confidence. The six large, burly sailors sitting at it didn't even see him until he cleared his throat. The sailor closest to him looked down. What do you want, kid? he asked. I'm not a kid, I'm a halfling, Jory told them, and I have a bet for you. Scram, kid, another one told him. Halfling, Jory corrected. Scram, kid, the sailor repeated. Jory shrugged. Okay, but if you won, you would have made a gold each. The table fell quiet. The first sailor looked at him curiously. What's the bet, halfling? I'll bet one of you try to punch me in the face. If you hit me, I'll give you each one gold. If you miss, you give me and my friends your table. The sailors laughed. They took the bet and chose which of them would attempt to punch the halfling for easy money. Joy assumed a defensive stance and concentrated on his opponent's body language. The sailor was quick, but Joy easily sidestepped the punch, causing his opponent to lose his balance and almost fall on his face. The sailors groaned and reluctantly gave up their table, playfully ribbing their companion for ruining their chance at some easy gold. Jory's companions joined him at the table. The six of them ate and drank, and eventually noticed a young human man with long hair set up at a table in the corner of the bar. He placed sheets of parchments, inkwells, and quills on the stage of the table. Tiesa got up and walked over to him. Sup, Tiesa said. Um, sup? The young guy replied, barely looking up as he organized his table. You the trivia guy? Diasa asked. Trivia bard? He corrected. Diasa threw a gold coin on the table. The bard looked at it. His eyes lit up for a second before his brow furrowed. If someone knew I'd let a team bribe me to win, I'd get my ass kicked. It's not a bribe, Diasa said. I want to ask you a specific question. Then give me everyone else's answers when it's over. Diasa wrote her question down and slipped it to him. He read it, nodded at her, and took her gold. Diesa brought their answer sheet and quill back to their table, and they waited for trivia night to begin. Once it had, Brunch Club felt extremely confident at the first question. How many heads does a chimera have? Having fought one, they knew the answer was in fact three. The next question, how are hags made? The Brunch Club knew that one too, having witnessed a hag born from the possessed form of a 13-year-old girl. What colored dragons can be found in swamps? They had seen a black dragon in the swamps of the Blue Lich Bog. What do beholders use their extra eyes for? This question took a little joy out of the game for them. 
that brought back the image of the undead beholder's eye-beam, disintegrating Salus before Vorjan sacrificed himself to bring her back. What do clerics use their holy symbols for? They slid the parchment to Drusilla, who wrote about the spell-focusing power of her holy symbol. How did winter wolves get their name? The brunch club remembered the deadly power of the winter wolf's icy breath when they fought them and got their winter wolf cloaks. And now for the bonus question, the trivia bard said. Who is the dark serpent? The brunch club felt confident about their answers and listened eagerly as the bard read them back. Chimeras have two heads. The brunch club looked at each other with puzzled looks on their faces. Hags are born during an eclipse. What the fuck, Alora said. This guy doesn't know shit. Green dragons are found in swamps. The brunch club shot angry looks at the bard. Beholders use their eye stalks to prevent their enemies from sneaking up on them. Well, that's just not true, muttered Salus. Clerics use their holy symbols to prevent undead from attacking them. Drusilla stewed, wordlessly. Winter wolves are called winter wolves because they prefer cold climates. I think he's just making everything up. Joy whispered. Finally, the host said, No one answered the bonus question correctly, so the identity of the Dark Serpent remains a secret. Well, that was bullshit, said Alora. I'm gonna go get the answers I paid for, said Diesa, standing up. I think you should all go up there and tell him how wrong he was, Joy suggested. I'll stay here with Tuft. As the others left the table, Joy flagged down a barmaid and requested a bottle of moonshine and two shot glasses. He filled each glass with the clear, strong-smelling liquid and slid one of them over to Tuft. The glasses were like tumblers in their small, halfling and gnome-sized hands. Tuft sipped his gingerly. Joy downed his whole glass in one gulp. As Drusilla, Salus, and Alora explained to the bard how wrong his answers were, Diesa thumbed through all the written answers regarding the Dark Serpent's identity. They confirmed what she already knew and offered no additional information. When they got back to the table, Tuft was halfway done with his glass of moonshine and grinned happily when he looked at Salus. Joy was filling his third glass. The night wore on, and eventually Drusilla, Alora, and Jory felt like calling it a night. They inquired about rooms. Rooms without company cost three silver. Rooms with company cost five. They chose the without company rate. Salus and Tuft decided to stay at the bar. Diesa wasn't quite ready to turn in, but didn't want to be a third wheel to Tuft and Salus. She took a room with company. As their friends left, Salus bid them good night and told them not to wait up. You two be safe, Drusilla said to them, and if you get into any trouble, you have the other half of my rocky talkie. Just call me. Yes, Mom, teased Salus, theatrically rolling her eyes. Tuft smiled as his cheeks turned red with alcohol and embarrassment. Alora and Jory stood by the door inside Drusilla's room and watched the cleric open the gray bag of tricks. She reached her hand in and pulled out a ball of gray fluff. She tossed it on the ground, and it transformed instantly into a gray panther. It stood, looking at her. She commanded it to be still. She pulled out another gray ball of fluff, tossed that to the floor, and it turned into a gray badger. The third ball of fluff produced a second badger. Drusilla spoke to each of the animals, giving them their commands. She told one badger to snuggle with Alora, one to snuggle with Jory, and the panther to snuggle with her. Alora happily clutched the warm, fuzzy badger to her chest and went to her room. Jory took one of Drusilla's pillows, laid it on the floor, and used that for his mattress. He used the badger for his pillow. Drusilla commanded the panther to curl up next to her in the bed. They all drifted off to sleep, aided by the warm animals snuggling with them. When the tavern keeper showed Diesa her room, she asked if she had any requests for her companion for the night. Diesa thought for a moment and said, Send me someone who makes your patrons feel the most vulnerable. The madam cocked an eyebrow and asked, Do you have a gender preference? Diesa shook her head. Go to room 3D, get comfortable, and wait for Rose. Diesa went to the room. She did not take off any of her armor. She found the darkest corner of the room, crossed her arms, and leaned against the wall to wait. The door opened a few minutes later. A beautiful woman walked in. She wore only the sheerest of veils, which left nothing to the imagination. She looked at Diesa and smiled. Sit down, 
Jesus said, motioning to the bed. You can cover yourself up with a sheet or something. I'm not interested in your body. I want to ask you some questions. Rose approached confidently. She sat on the corner of the bed, closest to Diesa. She did not cover herself. You only paid for my body, not my secrets. How much are your secrets worth? Diesa asked, tossing a gold coin next to her on the bed. Far more than my body, Rose replied, ignoring the gold coin. How much? That depends on the secrets. You want the dime a dozen ones? You could hear in any dockside bar, or the big, juicy, hefty secrets, Rose asked. Or we can start small and work our way up to the bigger ones if you want. Deesa narrowed her eyes at the barely clothed woman. I want good information. If you rob me, I'll cut off your left tit. Rose's eye contact never broke, and her smile never waned. But I need that one, she replied coyly. Deesa cracked a very slight smile. She had to admit inwardly that Rose was a formidable, self-assured woman. She liked her. Tell me what you know about the Dark Serpent, and don't tell me how he's a low-level thief who likes to talk big, because I've heard that already. Why do you want to know about him? Rose asked. Genuine curiosity broke through her seductive facade. He wrote me a letter, Diesa replied, referring to the note they'd found at the abandoned mine shaft when she'd first joined the party. Oh, scandalous, Rose teased. Information about the Dark Serpent? That'll cost you two gold. One gold, countered Diesa. One gold and a kiss, replied Rose. Fine, Diesa said. Rose told Diesa that the Dark Serpent name was Richard, and despite his reputation of being a petty thief that talks big, he was actually quite good at what he did. He preferred to steal and sell magic items rather than mundane gold and gems. What do you know about Sturgeon? Diesa asked. Rose told her that Sturgeon was a backwater town with not a lot going on. She did hear there was a decent-sized potion smuggling operation there, but it was discovered and terminated a, about a month ago. She also said there were rumors that if the kingdom of Drazan were ever to invade and claim Elnon for itself, Sturgeon would be one of the first towns they attacked. Have you ever heard of a druid named Rajat? asked Diesa. Doesn't ring a bell, Rose said. Diesa thought for a moment about other questions she had, but couldn't think of any. So she asked, What about the big, juicy, hefty secrets? How much for those? Fifty gold, Rose replied without hesitation. I assure you they're worth it. Dirty little secrets about very powerful people. Fifty gold? How do I know they're real? Diesa asked. You'll just have to trust me, Rose replied. After all, don't you like to feel vulnerable? No, Diesa said flatly. I just like secrets given up by vulnerable people. What about a favor? Anyone hurt you that you want killed? Rose laughed softly. I'm flattered, but no. I do know how to take care of myself. Fine. Fifty gold, agreed Diesa. What do you know? Do you know Lord Raymond Windsor, a local businessman who owns the Jade Serpent? I've met him briefly, Diesa said, thinking back to Lady Tyrol's gala. Rose informed Diesa that Windsor was a human sex trafficker, getting his sex workers from slavers from around the world. He was very, very wealthy, and therefore influential. But he might be getting nervous and keeping things more under wraps now that Calivar arrived in the city. Are you here of your own free will? Diesa asked. Rose's easy smile faded slightly. Whores don't typically choose to be whores, free will or not. It may not be the life I dreamed for myself, but we all have to do what we can to survive. At least I'm not at the Jade Serpent anymore. You are one of Windsor's slaves? Rose nodded. Her smile dissolved entirely. How'd you get out, pressed Diesa. You'll notice he has a scar on his cheek, Rose said with a hint of pride in her voice, though it become a little shaky as unpleasant memories flooded back to her. And I'm good at taking advantage of powerful people who like to feel vulnerable. It seems like the tables turn on you tonight, Diesa said with a smirk, but not mean or teasing. I think I'm the one who made you feel vulnerable. A smile returned to Rose's face. That may be so, but you still owe me fifty-two gold and a kiss. And five silver for your body, 
added Diesa as she leaned towards Rose's lips. Salas and Tuft finished their drink shortly after their friends left. Salas turned to Tuft and said, So, do you want to go back to your crib? I sleep in a bed, said Tuft. Salas laughed. Are you drunk? I think I can walk, he smiled. But we can't be too loud when we get home. Whoa, planning a big night, Salas joked. I, I, I mean, I'm, I mean, Tuft stammered. When we walk through the door, there's a bell on it, and I don't want to make my grandma. She's usually a heavy sleeper, but she always listens for the bell. They took the elevator back up to the city and began walking to Tufts. As they walked and chatted, Tufts said suddenly, I think that guy is watching us. Salas followed the direction of Tufts' pointing finger. A figure walked out of the darkness toward them. He drew his short sword. I think he has a friend said Tuft, as another figure approached them from another corner, sword also drawn. When they got closer, the first one spoke to them in a threatening, low, gruff tone. If you give us your gold, we won't have to gut you. Let me handle this, Salas whispered to Tuft. How? Tuft asked worriedly. With my amazing personality, she said. Hey, look, Salas said, turning to the bandit. We don't have a lot of money, we just came from the crusty clam. You guys look like you're familiar with it. Um, and we just spent most of our money there. The drinks at the clam don't cost that much, little ones, the second man snarled. Well, we weren't just there for the drinks, if you know what I mean, Salas said, and winked knowingly at them. We're a pretty <laughs> adventurous couple, and you know, the weird stuff costs more. A lot more. As if seeing them for the first time... The bandits looked at the two gnomes that stood before them. They looked with their bright copper and orange hair like they would, indeed, be into the weird stuff. I know you know what I'm talking about, Salas continued in a hushed tone. You guys look like you've spent a night or two at the clam. They nodded. One leaned in and spoke even lower. You ever have that, uh, that itch after you've been there? It's funny you should mention that, Salas told him. We were just talking about that. We didn't want to say anything too loud because we didn't know if it was contagious. Do you know how to get rid of it? The bandit asked. I really don't, Salas said. I was thinking of just trying fire. The man nodded his head, and they let them go in their way in peace. They hurried along. As they let themselves into the jewelry store and up the stairs to Tuff's room, he asked quietly, Are you really into the weird stuff? Salas smiled. Define weird. Rose woke up. The sun streamed in through the windows onto the sheets. She rolled over. When she realized she was alone, she felt surprisingly disappointed. She saw a stack of 52 gold pieces and five silver on the nightstand. A note lay next to it. When I'm back in Elnor, I'll be looking for more juicy gossip to buy. Information is as good as gold. Maybe the life you dreamed isn't out of reach just yet. Signed, D. Our tale will continue in episode 46. Episode 45 was written by Dominic White, Bethany Powers, and myself, Brian Mesmer. The audio recording of our D&D game session that inspired this episode will be available on our podcast channel this Thursday under the name Brunch Club Live. Additional role-playing contributions to the story by Bethany Powers, who plays Diesa, J.P. Black, who plays Drusilla, Liz Raychard, who plays Alora. Anna Flemke, who plays Salas, and Dominic White, who plays Jory. If you enjoyed this podcast, please help us out by sharing it with your friends and rating and reviewing us on your favorite podcast platform. We really appreciate it. More information about Rescued by Dragons and ways to support and follow us can be found at rescuedbydragons.com. Thank you for listening, and please join me next week to see what my players' choices and the roll of the dice have in store. Rose. Rose, perfect. Oh, Great. Behind Rose. In room 3D? 3 D. Three double D. Three D. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> Rose is Gone actually up. short for Rose and Paul. Rose and Krantz. Rose and Paul. Rose and Paul. Yeah, I was thinking Rose and Paul. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Not with the name, but okay. when, yeah. Okay. <laughs> She'll find you. Just make sure you're in whatever's comfortable. Oh my God, you're gonna get beat up. I was gonna say, armor. <laughs> She's gonna get you. <laughs>
<laughs> plate mail. <laughs> I was gonna say, Dieta doesn't fucking change. Just, yeah. <laughs> Why don't you loosen your bullets? <laughs> I'm gonna just leave my clothes on, head up, sit in like. No, I stand in the corner of the room in like the shadows a little bit. <laughs> Are you hiding or just staying? Yeah, you're just, in the cold. You're just, That's how I am. You're just drooding. This is where yeah. Diesa feels comfortable with both axes drawn. Yeah. <laughs> um, after a few minutes, the door slowly creaks open. Um, and in walks a woman clad in just mostly see-through, like, blue silks. Not silks, um, like, scarves. Um, think like the, uh... I think like Arabian, like mostly see-through. I don't know the actual word for them. Okay, sure. You know, what I mean? like the scarf. Yeah, just like jasmine. Yeah, like from jasmine. Aladdin. But you can. There's just everything kind of visible mm-hmm. through the folds of mostly see-through scarf. And she looks around. Oh, I see you. One of those. Just brooding. Yeah. There. Yeah. Sure. Uh, sit down. You can put like a Anything sheet on you. or whatever. Yeah. No, that's fine. Here's a fucking piece of gold. I'm not Actually, gonna touch you. I I'm don't really care. What? Oh. This is odd. <laughs> no, I just I came for the gossip. What's going on? Like, I heard you make people feel vulnerable. Usually when they ask me to. Okay. Cool. <laughs> That's not what I want. I want to know what other people tell oh, you. Oh, you want to be a little man? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm in fucking control. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. I'm sorry, Rose. You, you seem <laughs> all right, sweetie. You seem lovely. I've Your heard scarves that are wicked cute. <laughs> Honestly, adorable. Where did you get them? I like the ones with a little shine, but I digress. Um, <laughs> what I really want to know is what you know. Mm. About the goings on in town, anything about Sturgeon. I hear you, but honey, I don't work for free. Well, I've already paid you a silver and given you a gold piece. You've paid me for my body, not for my secrets. How much are your secrets? They're much more expensive. How much are your secrets? Depends. Do you want the big, hefty, juicy ones? Juicy. Or not the ones that are a dime a dozen. We can start small and work our way up to something bigger if you want. Oh man. <laughs> this is the hottest interrogation oh, ever. Yep. Rocky talkie me if you need help. Laura's like, tag me in. Tag me in. <laughs> I too am a woman of many talents, so if there's anything favors I could do for you. Hmm. I'm particularly good at breaking and entering, stealing, (laughs) finding secrets, but you know, as you know, I need to find my sources, so Mm. do you hear any whispers, or do you know anything in particular about... The merchants in the area, Sturgeon, maybe anyone named the Dark Serpent that you've heard of. Beyond just the fact that he's a petty thief, because I've heard that enough times. Hmm. Where to start? Where to start? Let's see. And if you try to steal from me, I will probably cut off your left tip, so don't even try. (laughs) Oh, but I need that one. (laughs) Do you? I'm sure you could milk cows for the rest of your life if you wanted. <laughs> so the Dark Serpent. Mm-hmm. What do you want to know about him? He left me a letter. Ooh. Scandalous. Two gold and I'll tell you what I know. One gold. One gold and a kiss. Five. <sighs> Deal. <laughs> He's... Still got it, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so impressed. 